Thank you very much. Yes, uh, so you know that in the afternoon today will be the first tutorial session where you will have to implement some MIP models yourself uh, using Python interfaces of Express or uh, Skip. Uh, and so before that, we should also theoretically talk a bit about modeling and especially MIP modeling. But maybe to get started, let me give you a bit of context. You've uh, heard uh, Martin Grutz's talk. Yesterday, he um, was an amazing man to really bring mathematics into practice. And one of his favorite slides was this one. Uh, he calls it the problem solving cycle in modern applied mathematics. And he had like some fancy PowerPoint animation with it. Um, and I want to uh, bring this up in order to show that in order to bring um, uh, mathematics into practice, modeling is usually one of the first steps. So if you have a real problem, the first step is usually that you well try to understand it, then model it as a method, ma mathematical model and uh, try to quickly generate some solutions via heuristics maybe, and then try to evaluate them uh, in order to understand how good your model is. Uh, this can, for instance, happen via simulation, right? And then you will quickly realize the model is probably not correct. So you will go back to the model, modify it, go back and forth between the problem. At some point, you will also try more sophisticated solution algorithms, maybe develop new theory um, if uh, the existing solution methods are not good enough, um, uh, derive from this theory new algorithms, and then go to the computer science side, implement everything efficiently, with hardware, software, data, and try to uh, also display it to the practitioners uh, such that they can look at it and tell you that probably your model is still wrong. You go back to modeling uh, back and forth until eventually you converge to something that the practitioner is happy. But yes, everything starts with modeling. It's the first and uh, the repeated step in, in this process. And so what is modeling? Well, uh, let's maybe be very general. Modeling is often referred to as an art. Um, and uh, that's actually a good analogy because we can learn something from that. Uh, there is this quote that is attributed to uh, several people. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth. And in some sense, that's also true about mathematical modeling because a model is never the reality. It's always a lie that helps us to see some particularly particular aspects of a problem better than if we look at every detail. So we select, we ignore aspects, we simplify, we emphasize certain things, we weight the importance of something. And this all is also a creative process. Also, again, something that it has in common with art, right? And that can at some point also be rather scary because art is something that usually you think you can't really learn, right? Either I am an artist or not. But the good thing is that mathematical modeling like art also has a lot about of, of craftsmanship, right? So there are tools and skills that you can learn uh, in order to become uh, a good modeler. And so uh, this is what we want to do today, at least some steps, right? Uh, so I want to talk generally about the process of building a model and um, then focus a bit on uh, which decision variables to use. In MIP, uh, we often have the question of binary versus general integer variables, for instance. Um, and uh, on a TSP example, I want to uh, get a bit into the um, uh, many choices that you often have when you model something and the impact that they can have on solving. Um, if we look at some special constraints, logical constraints, indicator constraints, which you will also see in the exercise in the afternoon, uh, and then some concluding remarks on yeah, how not to do it, how to do it, what to take care of. All right, let's get started. So building a model. Um, so modeling is describing a particular situation using a collection of some um, logical mathematical relationships. Uh, in optimization, that particularly means we need an objective function to evaluate the quality of solutions. We need constraints to define um, which solutions are feasible, right? Uh, and now I want to ask you, why do we build models? What is, what is the great thing about models? Uh, I have a few points here, but I think that this is also something that probably you have an opinion about or experience with. What have you used models for already? 
why are models better than reality? Or Uh -huh. Yes, it, it can be cheaper to evaluate. Yeah, we don't even know it's too detailed, right? It's... What have you used models for? Yes, they're easy to, easier to understand and to analyze. Prediction, very good, very good, yes. So in reality, um, you don't want to try everything, right? Uh, some things might be even difficult or uh, dangerous to try, right? But in a model, you can just play around with it, can see what happens in the future, at least in your model. Yes, all of these things. Um, and uh, also to capture maybe essential aspects um, because a, a model reduces. And so um, we focus on the thing that we're interested in and uh, for optimization that of course also means for instance the ob ob objective function right okay and so here is a slide on the process uh, of building a model so of course everything starts with thinking about what is important to the situation uh, you have to talk to the people who actually know the problem um, and slowly derive an abstraction of the complete problem that captures the important things um, and here are different steps in this. So first of all, identifying the problem. And by problem now, of course, most of us think about a real world problem, uh, maybe in logistics, supply chain management or whatever, but this can also be an abstract problem. Uh, some uh, questions in uh, pure mathematics can be formulated as optimization problems, right? Um, and then at the end of the day, you need to really uh, single out one or several concrete questions, which is often related to the ob objective function, right? Then, then you need to formulate a, a problem. So uh, you need to have notation, mathematical, logical notation, um, and never forget that your model is an abstraction of reality. Um, building a model, with building, and I mean really implementing it. So you need to actually need uh, to use tools, software, um, use an API of some solver that will later solve your model or a modeling language. Um, and uh, when you do this, then it's already very valuable if you already think about possible alternative models. So you don't only uh, hard code one model, but you already code different options of the model, uh, or at least leave your implementation open to different alternatives. And then yes, so uh, if you, for instance, implemented the model in uh, some API that can already interface to a solver, then you will get uh, first solutions, hopefully. Um, we are mostly focusing now on MIP solvers. And if you have a solution, you can check the validity in practice. And at the very end, if you have uh, such a solution procedure, you can actually try to bring the solution back into practice. But that involves a lot of things that we will also not uh, handle here at CEO at work. This is a, a very detailed and uh, often difficult process and can be where a lot of projects fail. So you've solved the problem mathematically, right? But that doesn't mean you can convince the practitioners to actually use your solution. Um, you need a lot of help from also non-mathematicians often. And uh, the important part in this thing is actually are all these arrows that you see on the left. So because yes, this is a feedback loop. So each step helps to uh, refine also the previous stages, right? You will realize and, and understand your model better and better, and you go back to the drawing board and improve things. Yeah? That's also why it's important not to hard code uh, each and every decision, but to leave flexibility. Very simple example for the start. Okay, all of you have heard of the knapsack problem, but just let's go through these ones. So a uh, burglar has a knapsack, it breaks into a house, can carry 15 kilograms, and there are several items here of different value. Um, what should he take? How do you model this? Um, so there are always three important questions, variables, constraints, objective function. And I usually uh, begin with the decision variables. Yeah? Um, 
in this case, it's simply take an item, yes or no. So this is uh, clear that this becomes a binary variable for each of these items. Uh, then the constraint is the 15 kilogram. Yes, uh, so this is a weighted linear constraint as follows. And the objective function is the revenue here scaled into 1,000 euros. Um, you could, of course, also have written 2,000 x1, 1,000 x2, uh, 2000 x3 and so on uh, but already this is a modeling choice uh, that you've made here uh, by using different units than euros rather using thousand euros in order to keep the numbers smaller yeah so this is already where you have actually made a conscious decision it was that there were several several uh, possibilities here yeah and then the final model is a simple binary uh, program no? okay um, and so here it was pretty clear that we're talking we're using binary decision variables but often it's not so clear what kind of variable types to use and so I want to spend some time on discussing when to use um, more general integer variables yeah so and I think a, a good example here is the Sudoku yeah uh, all of you probably know this uh, Sudoku game. The task is for each of the fields to display uh, or find a number between one and nine, an integer. Some are pre-given, and then each row, each column, and each of these uh, boxes here must contain each number exactly one. Um, and this is, uh, naively, you could uh, model this with 81 integer variables, nine by nine is the standard format of a Sudoku, and uh, uh, have 81 integer variables for each of the fields. But this is not a good idea in this case, because integer variables us usually suggest that where there is some quantity and some ordering in, in the values, right? If you have an integer variable, usually one comes, uh, one, two, three, four, you, you can count, um, and um, this is actually not relevant here in the Sudoku. These numbers one to nine, they are not actually ordered, right? They are just different symbols and all you care about that you don't have the same two symbols in one of the rows, columns or boxes. And so integer variables somehow uh, intuitively already are not uh, a good idea to model this. And one can also try this and see that uh, this is the case uh, computationally. But so as a general rule of thumb, general integers are good when they represent really quantities and when the ordering of the values is really important. But whenever it's just some different values, probably it's better to use binary variables. And now how do you model this using binary variables? Um, well, you can do this by adding another index. So you have now um, each cell as uh, as a row i and a column j um, and then for each cell well you don't only have one decision whether to take uh, numbers from one to nine but you have actually nine decisions do i take number one do i take number two and so on yeah and so you have nine binary variables per cell so this blows up a bit yeah this is a, um, a decision or this is a model that uses more decision variables than if you just use integer variables x i j k um, and the obviously first constraint is that in each cell only exactly one number should be which you can express as sum over these x i j k equals one for each cell summing up all over all the k's yeah and in some sense, it doesn't matter anymore that these are numbers. You could also think of this as colors, right? Each number has a color, and uh, you just want to have different colors in each box, row, and so on. Yeah. Um, and so what we've not modeled yet is exactly these incompatibilities. So you could now, for each pair of cells that are in a box or in a row or in a column, you could add such a very simple uh, constraint that forbids that both of them are one. So for instance, in the cell one one and one two, um, the number one must only appear once. Yeah, but this becomes pretty large, right? Because how many pairs do you have? 
Yeah, you have two out of nine for each box, for each row and for each column, and this for each of the colors. Okay, how, how can you model this uh, maybe more compactly? Yes, so in each row, uh, you, you can, so for each uh, color or for each number, you can include immediately all of the uh, cells in one box, one row, or one column. So uh, sometimes this is called a clique inequality. Um, a clique is uh, in a subset of some nodes in a graph that are all connected. Yeah, All of these cells in one box may not have the same number. Yeah. OK. And so actually what we are building here is uh, the, try to think about it more abstractly, a graph coloring model. Yes, underlying this Sudoku is a graph with 81 nodes. Yeah, all the nodes in one row are connected. So you have a nine click in each row. You have a nine click in each column and a nine click in each box. Um, and in each of these cliques, each color must appear only once. So this is a generalization of the Sudoku problem. And this can be uh, modeled like this. Yeah. OK, what can we learn from this more generally? Um, it is some sort of an assignment structure that we have here. Yeah? We have uh, variables with these three indices. Here now I call them V, R, and C because this is a screenshot from somewhere and please forgive the uh, strange set notation. These are really the integers between one and nine. Um, so we don't even have an objective function here. This is a feasibility problem. So max or min is zero. Um, and for each of the uh, rows and the colors, uh, this is used exactly once for each of the uh, colors and the columns as well, and for each of the uh, um, boxes, uh, for each of the uh, fields, uh, for each of the entries, you have exactly one number, and for each of the boxes, you have exactly one number. So um, this is, uh, why, why do I say assignment structure? So um, you have uh, the assignment problem is the following. You have a set of objects uh, and a set of, for instance, people on the other side, and you want to assign exactly one object to exactly one person. Um, and this goes with these uh, sum uh, equals to one constraints. Once you sum over all the persons, uh, every person receives uh, one object, and the other constraint is that every object receives exactly one person. Yeah, this is a classical assignment uh, structure and that appears in many problems as a substructure. Yeah, so um, this is often uh, the case that uh, these uh, pure optimization problems like graph coloring or here assignments um, or let's say network flow or whatever, uh, that they usually don't appear in their pure form in reality, but when you model a real problem, often you combine different different, uh, different types of problems into one. And it's important to recognize that. Okay, so there are many more versions of Sudokus and you could probably all uh, model them in a similar way. Um, all right, so this was about integers versus binaries. Now, a different example for many choices in modeling. So modeling has a, uh, often uh, many degrees of freedom. And uh, one of the most well-known optimization problems certainly is the traveling salesperson problem. Yeah? So given a complete graph, you would want to find a Hamiltonian cycle or a tour, uh, which covers each uh, node exactly once and has minimum length. And there's a classic MIP formulation that is also used by, uh, or the basis of the most uh, efficient code, uh, which is Concord, which is the 
um, the, the following formulation here, where you have a binary variable for each of the edges, whether they are used, then at each node, you need to have exactly two edges attached. That's the first constraint. And if you only have these constraints, then it can happen that you get subtools, right? Uh, so this uh, solution here would satisfy the first set of constraints. Each node has two uh, edges attached to it. But of course, this is not a full tour, right? Um, because you have a subset of the nodes here uh, from which no edge is outgoing. And these are these sub to elimination constraints, which you would need to add in order to get a complete formulation. Um, for each subset of the node set, not empty and not the entire set, uh, you want the sum of the outgoing edges across this blue line here uh, to sum up to two. You want to have one out, one in. Yeah? Uh, now, what is the problem with this formulation? It, obviously, it uh, can be used to build like highly efficient code but there are very many of these subsets. So if you really want to write this down explicitly, you get exponentially many uh, constraints. This may be possible for small problems, but certainly not for larger problems. And uh, so the, um, uh, if you uh, want to uh, have a first shot at an optimization problem at a model, then having such an exponential size formulation is often difficult, right? So that's hard to implement with uh, an out of the box solver. Uh, so it's very interesting to also look in complex formulations and here is one that doesn't need exponentially many constraints. That's the classic formulation for the TSP from 1960, uh, miller tucker zemlin formulation, and uh, that uses different decision variables. So this considers the problem as a or each tour as a directed tour. So really give it an orientation. And so we don't only have one binary variable for each arc, but for each forward and backward arc between two nodes, y, i, j, whether it's used or not. Um, and here you have similar constraints as before, where you say that uh, from each node, you have exactly one outgoing arc and one ingoing arc. That's correct for a, a directed tour. But again, here you could, of course, have subtools um, like before. And in order to exclude subtools here in this model, we have a different uh, technique, which is we really give establish a concrete order between uh, uh, of the nodes. We basically say which node is the first, the second, the third, or counting like in computer science position zero, one, two, three up to position n minus one, n is the number of nodes. And so um, we have these u numbers for uh, yeah, counting the number of nodes that were visit, uh, visited before the current node i. So uh, u one is set to zero. That means we arbitrarily break some symmetry by saying that whichever two I have, node one is the first one. Okay, and then I need constraints in order to establish that the UI actually really encode the order of a tour so that there is a consistency between these Y variables and the U variables. And uh, we see how this is possible. Um, for each of the arcs, IJ, you have one constraint. Uh, and this constraint involves the variable Y. Um, and you immediately see if Y, IJ, is zero, so if this arc is not used, then actually this constraint is pretty boring. Yeah? U i j minus u j should be at most n minus two. That's certainly correct because the u i's are, uh, well, the first one is zero and the other ones go at most up to n minus one. So the, this difference can never exceed n minus two. So if the arc is not used, this is actually a redundant constraint. But it becomes interesting if the y i j is one, uh, and then what is implied by this constraint? Yeah, for this you need to rearrange, rearrange the constraint a bit. And we can do this a bit with the aid on the blackboard, right? So you have u i minus u j plus n minus one. 
times one. This is when the arc is used. So y i j equals one. Then at most n minus two. Okay, let's bring this to the other side. Then we have here n minus two, here minus one, right? Okay, so what does that mean? Let's bring uj to the other side. And maybe we'll get rid of the minuses. Okay, so then essentially what we say is that uj must be at least ui plus one, which totally makes sense, right? If I go from i in towards the direction of j, uh, then the index of j, the position of j must be at least increased by one. Yeah. So this is actually also already an example of a big M constraint, uh, which we will see more generally later. Yeah. So uh, you have a binary variable multiplied with a rather large factor, sometimes called a big M. And if that binary variable here is, zero, is one, it becomes redundant. If it's zero in this case, um, no, if it's zero, it becomes redundant. If it's one, then actually something happens. Okay, and so um, with these ordering constraints here, you can actually make sure that there can only be one tour. Yeah. And how many constraints do I have? As many as arcs. Yeah, so that's pretty compact. Okay, that's the miller tucker assembly formulation. Um, then you can take this even a bit further. Um, you can in, you can take the miller tucker assembly formulation and extend it uh, by interpreting this as a, what is called a fixed charge network design problem. And I do not want to go into detail how this is modeled now. Read the paper, it's interesting. Uh, but my point is here not to go into these technical details, but just to show that there is really uh, a lot of freedom and to move on to uh, um, uh, a computational study that has been done on these formulations, a paper that I think only appeared as a preprint and is not very well known to my knowledge. So, um, uh, where these different TSP formulations were compared with different uh, um, uh, strengthenings or modifications. So um, we have three base models, right? And um, um, we can consider different uh, changes that are redundant to the model that all model the same problem, but uh, that can have well, this is the question, uh, effect on the performance of solvers. And so in this paper, they compared then for all these different formulations, uh, the performance, I think, of Steplex as the then state of the, uh, the art uh, MIP solver and SKIP as an academic solver. So examples, for instance, how you can modify this formulation um, are that you remove the upper bounds on YI. Let's go one step back. So here, for instance, the, the, uh, the UI, uh, was is bounded by n minus one. That's not really necessary because that is somehow implied also by these other constraints here. Yeah. Um, but you can keep them. What is better? Unclear. Also, the flow conservation constraints that are in these uh, in this complicated model here can be relaxed. You don't actually need equality. It's enough to ask for inequality, and that will imply full feasibility. And yes, there are many additional strengthenings, some of which also a solver can uh, figure out. Um, um, and some strengthenings also, which the solver does not find, so they can uh, lead to reductions in the uh, phase that Timo will explain to you tomorrow, which is called pre-processing. Yeah? Um, so all in all, there were 64 models uh, uh, compared all equivalent theoretically, some solve in seconds, others do not even solve in a day. Uh, and that's not necessarily related to the size of the problem, right? Uh, and so I want to uh, summarize some conclusions that they bring at the end of this paper, as I think, because we can learn something from that. Uh, so uh, first of all, just um, very important, precisely state your model when you report computational results. 
yeah because um, otherwise you cannot reproduce the results yeah uh, this is of course a bit more uh, uh, taking it one step further would be also make your code public that you use for your computational experiments because otherwise it may also be hard to reproduce your results if you don't describe the implementation in sufficient detail in your paper but then um, also very important just because you've found one formulation of a model which is theoretically correct but does not work in practice does not mean that there is no such model yeah maybe obvious but keep it in mind um, and then uh, uh, one thing is that of course the what is a good model heavily depends on the solver that you use or the algorithm that you use for it so um, Often now in practical projects, we use out of the box solvers because MIP solvers have just become uh, incredibly performant out of the box. But that also means that we do not always know what's going on in these solvers. Timo will enlighten you tomorrow on some details of this, but it is really a, a, a very complex uh, bag of tricks that's going on there. And so um, uh, you always have to think about model in combination with solver. And so one thing that they identified here, for instance, um, that the branching works differently in Skip and CPLEX. And so CPLEX, the faster solver, uh, was, yeah, it was faster, but it was also much more dependent on these modeling changes, while Skip was more smooth, kind of, uh, and, and less uh, impacted by it. And uh, then what can you also learn from this? So for instance, from this branching uh, observations, they realized that, well, in some of these models, the integer variables actually do not need to be enforced by branching. And uh, something that is now quite common um, is the notion of implicit integer variables, which exist in Skip, for instance, but also in other solvers, uh, which are variables that, well, in uh, any feasible solution should and will have integer value, but which you do not need to enforce during your solution algorithm because they are implied by the integrality of the remaining variables. Yeah? And so you can, for instance, also you as a user tell such information to a solver if you are aware of it. Okay, so um, this was about the degree of freedom. Now let's come to some uh, particular types of constraints, some of which we have already seen. Yeah. Uh, so in uh, MIP modeling, lots of, uh, uh, lots of things that you want to model are logical relationships. Yeah. And so logical constraints are important. And some uh, solvers even have specific constructs for that that go beyond uh, simple linear inequalities. You don't always have to remodel everything into linear inequalities. Sometimes you can also use uh, more high level constructs. And here are three examples an AND constraint, that means a variable is one if and only if all the other variables, binary variables, are one. An OR constraint, R is one if at least one of the X's here is one. And an X OR constraint would be R is one if uh, there are an odd number of ones here in this list of constraints. So these are examples for logical constraints that are supported by some solvers. And uh, they make it sometimes easier to uh, model problems, also to understand more structure because you don't get lost in the uh, more detailed linearizations. And, but one thing that I also want to discuss with you is um, whether these constraints and how these constraints can be linearized, particularly focusing on the end constraint. So for the OR constraint, maybe as a simple exercise for you, what would be a linear inequality um, that, yeah, the, the sum of the, yes, so let's just write this down. So, well, what you want is if R is one, then the sum is 
should be at least one, right? And if R is zero, then, well, nothing, right? We don't want to, uh, no, if, if, well, then, then the sum should be zero, right? Okay, so now, how do we model this into one constraint or several constraints? If at least R. Uh huh. Yes, so if R is zero, then this is certainly a correct constraint. If R is one, then it actually enforces what we have here. Hmm? Uh, yes, R, so R is a binary variable. R is divided by n, if n is the number of variables. Yes, or we could also write this here. Uh -huh. So if one of the, if all the x's are zero, then that doesn't imply anything. And if one of them is one, then the R must jump up to one, right? Because zero will not be feasible anymore. Yes, very good. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, let's move on with the slides. So uh, what are the advantages? I've already mentioned some of them. So um, we can uh, quickly jump over this um, and go to some visualizations. So one, uh, relaxation for these, um, or I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mixing it up, right? It's, that's an, that's an end. Okay. So, um, uh, this is now for an end constraint. Yeah. And, um, here we have two different linearizations that are displayed one strong on the left side and one weak on the right side. So on uh, the left side, let's focus on this first. Um, we want to enforce that if xi is zero, if any xi is zero, then also r must be zero. This can be enforced by n such constraints, yeah? xi greater than equal to r. And then if r is one, then all of the xi's must also be one, right? Um, uh, no, if, if r is zero, then, uh, then at least one of the xi's must be zero. Yes, that's the implication of the upper one, sorry. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So um, this is a rather strong relaxation. It's uh, because um, if you uh, look at this here, for instance, for the example of two uh, X variables and one R variable. So X1 would be here, X2 would be here, and the R variable, the resultant is the Z axis. Uh, then the vertices of these it's an equality system here uh, are um, integer yeah so if you solve the lp over this you will actually get an integer answer that's a good property uh, however you also get a correct relaxation if you uh, aggregate all of these uh, low lower inequalities here to this one because then you also get the implication if r is uh, if uh, uh, r is one, then all of the x's need to be one. But you see that if you do this, then actually you get several fractional vertices here. 
Uh, and so this is only a correct formulation if you additionally enforce the integrality. Um, and so here again, you see two different uh, ways to model this. And um, um, maybe let me skip over the part of the, how this is related to domain propagation, because I think in pre-solving, Timo may also talk about this tomorrow. And uh, let me get on to some uh, further modeling constructs, which are also logical relationships. Uh, they are called indicator constraints. Um, and also involve a binary so-called indicator variable. So this helps you to model if-then relationships. So in the most simple form, if a binary variable is one, then another one is zero. Y can just be a continuous variable. And uh, this is the notation for it. Sometimes we don't even write x equals one, but just x, because this is a Boolean value in some sense. Uh, and more generally, also, you can use this to model, uh, to activate or deactivate uh, general inequalities. Yes? If x0 is 1, then this inequality is enforced. Otherwise, it is relaxed. Okay. Um, and these indicator variables are quite useful. Um, if you do not have an upper bound on the slack of this inequality. So if for the case x0 equals 0, you kind of really do not know how large uh, this quantity will be, then it's hard to linearize this. And so uh, this is one advantage um, um, that we also see in more detail here. So the linearization of such an indicator constraint would look very similar to what we've already seen now in several examples. You add such a term uh, 1 minus the indicator variable times a big M. And if the big M is zero in this case, uh, if, if the Y is zero, uh, it's redundant. If the big M is large enough and if the Y is one, then you enforce the constraint. However, if this M becomes huge, then the numerics in the solver really can get pretty nasty. Also, if uh, you cannot even bound this value here, then basically you would need to use M infinity for a correct model and then that's not possible anymore. Then it's better to rely really on these indicator constraints where the solver can, during the solving process, uh, activate and deactivate this constraint depending on uh, in which uh, region of the feasible space it is. Okay, so uh, here is an example on why this can get tricky, but we will hear more about this on Thursday, because if you have such a constraint and X takes the value of 10 to the minus seven, then this is obviously feasible, but uh, um, with even with y equals one, but this is just uh, way too close to zero. So this is just kind of almost a rounding error be below the numerical tolerance of the solver. Yeah, so use big M's only if they are not too large. Okay, so to summarize what uh, some things that you should do and should not do. So, um, what should you assume about the structure that a MIP solver can recognize? Um, Timo will tell you more about uh, the actual algorithms, but for instance, if you have a network flow problem, a single layer network flow problem, MIP solvers can detect that. But if there's some logic between these network flow problems and some layers underneath, that may already be tricky, such connections. What solvers are good uh, is to detect um, um, uh, uh, things from single or pairs of constraints, but it uh, gets more and more difficult as the structures grow. Then if you have symmetry in your model, um, usually it's very tempting to try to break this. It's a good idea to use a model that is not symmetric, but if you have a symmetric model, sometimes it's better to let the solver actually handle it because uh, they already have very many sophisticated techniques for handling symmetry. So always at least try. Um, and so uh, a few take away uh, messages. So compact is not always the better model. Sometimes uh, increasing the model size, like in the Sudoku, having more decision variables actually makes a much better model. Um, then of course, tight formulations, tight LP relaxations are good. So this is related to the number of fractional variables that you see in the LP relaxation. Um, numerics is important. 
Um, so more than 10 to the power of six difference is not a good idea. Um, and this is a, a few things about the modeling process. So often in the beginning, models may be infeasible. That's very normal. Uh, MIP solvers usually can detect those trivial errors and you need to sort of learn from them, right? Um, then if you look into this and fix these problems, sometimes you get unsatisfying solutions and your practitioners will say, oh, but this is not allowed or I have a better solution which disregards some of your constraints or whatever. So you have to have patience to actually go through this process. Uh, the third thing is that MIP solvers often uh, give you very extreme solutions. Right? I mean, they try to optimize the last bit out of the objective function. That may not always be what the practitioner wants, or so he doesn't tell you about that. Right? He will just complain later when you pre uh, pre uh, present him with a solution which is not robust um, uh, or so. Um, blah, blah, blah. Some more general considerations, <laughs> data. Um, but um, I, th I think uh, the main message is that modeling interacts with solving and it's a lengthy process. You need patience and experience. Uh, and uh, you will have time to test this, of course, in the tutorials, but also even more so in the computational challenge of the second week. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>